The Lives of the Saints by Father Alban Butler, January 1st, St. Fulgentius, Bishop A.D. 533. Fabius, Claudius Gordianus Fulgentius, was the descendant of a noble senatorian family of Carthage, but much decayed in its splendor by the invasion of the Vandals. His father Claudius, being unjustly deprived of his house in Carthage, which was made over to the Arian priests, settled at an estate belonging to him at Telepti, the capital city of the province of Byzacana. Our saint was born in 468, about 30 years after the barbarians had dismembered Africa from the Roman Empire. He was educated in sentiments of piety with his younger brother under the care of his mother, Mariana, who was left a young widow. Being by her particular direction, taught the Greek very young, he spoke it with as proper and exact an accent as if it had been his native language. He also applied himself to Latin and all the useful parts of human literature under masters distinguished for consummate abilities. Yet he knew how to mingle business with study, for he took upon himself the regulation of the family concerns in order to ease his mother of the burden. His prudent circumspection in all the affairs he transacted, his virtuous conduct, his mild carriage to all, and more especially his deference for his mother, without whose express orders or approbation he never did anything, caused him to be beloved and admired wherever his name was known. He was chosen procurator, that is, lieutenant governor, and general receiver of the taxes of Byzacona. But it was not long before he grew disgusted with the world, and being justly alarmed at its dangers, he armed himself against them by pious reading, assiduous prayer, and rigorous fasting. His visits to monasteries were frequent, and happening among other books of spiritual entertainment to read a sermon of St. Augustine on the 36th Psalm, in which that father treats of the world and the short duration of human life, he felt within him strong desires of embracing the monastic state. Huneric, the Arian king, had driven most of the Orthodox bishops from their sees. One of these, named Faustus, had erected a monastery in Byzacena. It was to him that the young nobleman addressed himself for admittance, but Faustus, immediately objecting the tenderness of his constitution, discouraged his desires with words of some harshness. Go, said he, and first learn to live in the world abstracted from its pleasures. Who can well suppose that you, on a sudden, relinquishing a life of softness and ease, can take up with our coarse diet and clothing, and can inure yourself to our watchings and fastings? The saint with downcast eyes modestly replied, He who hath inspired me with the will to serve him can also furnish me with courage and strength. This humble yet resolute answer induced Faustus to admit him on trial. The saint was then in the twenty-second year of his age. The news of so unthought of an event both surprised and edified the whole country. Many even imitated the example of the governor. But Mariana, his mother, in transports of grief, ran to the monastery, crying out at the gates, Faustus, restore to me my son, to the people their governor. The church always protects widows. Why then rob you me, a desolate widow, of my son? She persisted several days in the same tears and cries. Nothing that Faustus could urge was sufficient to calm her or prevail with her to depart without her son. This was certainly as great a trial of Fulgentius's resolution as it could well be put to. But the love of God, having the ascendant in his breast, gave him a complete victory over all the suggestions of nature. Faustus approved his vocation and accordingly recommended him to the brethren. The saint, having now obtained all he wished for in this world, made over his estate to his mother, to be discretionally disposed of by her in favor of his brother, as soon as he should be arrived at a proper age. He totally abstained from oil and everything savory, from wine also, drinking only water. His mortifications brought on him a dangerous illness, yet after recovery he abated nothing in them. The persecution breaking out anew, Faustus was obliged to withdraw, and our saint, with his consent, repaired to a neighboring monastery, of which Felix, the abbot, would fain resign to him the government. Fulgentius was much startled at the proposal, but in length was prevailed upon to consent that they should jointly execute the functions. It was admirable to observe with what harmony these two holy abbots for six years governed the house. No contradiction ever took place between them, each always contended to comply with the will of his colleague. Felix undertook the management of the temporal concerns. Fulgentius's province was to preach and instruct.
In the year 499, the country being ravaged by an eruption of the Numidians, the two abbots were necessitated to fly to Sicavenaria, a city of the proconsular province of Africa. Here it was that an Arian priest ordered them to be apprehended and scourged on account of their preaching the consubstantiality of the Son of God. Felix, seeing the executioner seize first on Fulgentius, cried out, Spare that poor brother of mine whose delicate complexion cannot bear torments. Let them rather be my portion who am strong of body. They accordingly, at the instigation of this wicked priest, fell on Felix first, and the old man endured their stripes with the greatest alacrity. When it was Fulgentius's turn to experience the same rigorous treatment, he bore the lashes with great patience. But feeling the pain excessive that he might gain a little respite and recruit his spirits, he requested his judge to give ear to something he had to impart to him. The executioners thereupon, being commanded to desist, he began to entertain him with an account of his travels. This savage monster expected nothing more than some overtures to be proposed to him of an intention to yield, but finding himself disappointed in the utmost rage, ordered his torments to be redoubled. At length, having glutted his barbarity, the confessors were dismissed, their clothes rent, their bodies inhumanly torn, and their beards and hair plucked off. The very Arians were ashamed of such cruelty, and their bishop offered to punish the priest, if Fulgentius would but undertake his prosecution. His answer was that a Christian is never allowed to seek revenge, and, for their parts, it was incumbent on them not to lose the advantage of patience, and the blessings accruing from the forgiving of injuries. The two abbots, to avoid an additional effort of the fury of these heretics, traveled to Edidi, on the confines of Mauritania. Here, Fulgentius went aboard a ship for Alexandria, being desirous, for the sake of greater perfection, to visit the deserts of Egypt, renowned for the sanctity of the solitaries who dwelt there. But the vessel touching at Sicily, St. Eulalius, abbot of Syracuse, diverted him from his intended voyage on assuring him that a perfidious dissension had severed this country from the communion of Peter, meaning that Egypt was full of heretics, with whom those that dwelt there were obliged either to join in communion or be deprived of the sacraments, the liberality and hospitality of Fulgentius to the poor, out of the small pittance he received for his particular subsistence, made Eulalius condemn himself of remissness in those virtues, and for the future imitate so laudable an example. Our saint, having laid aside the thoughts of pursuing his voyage to Alexandria, embarked for Rome to offer up his prayers at the tombs of the apostles. One day, passing through a square called Palma Aurea, he saw Theodoric, the king of Italy, seated on an exalted throne, adorned with pompous state, surrounded by the Senate and his court, with all the grandeur of the city displayed in the greatest magnificence. Ah, said Fulgentius, how beautiful must the heavenly Jerusalem be if earthly Rome be so glorious. What honor, glory, and joy will God bestow on the saints in heaven, since here in this perishable life he clothes with such splendor the lovers and admirers of vanity. This happened towards the latter part of the year 500, when Hat King made his first entry into Rome. Fulgentius returned home in a short time after, and was received with incredible joy. He built a spacious monastery in Byzacana, but retired to a cell himself, which was situate on the seashore. Here his time was employed in writing, reading, prayer, mortification, and the manual labor of making mats and umbrellas of palm tree leaves. Faustus, who was his bishop, obliged him to resume the government of his monastery, and many places at the same time sought him for their bishop. King Thrasimund, having prohibited by edict the ordination of orthodox bishops, several sees by this means had been long vacant and destitute of pastors. The orthodox prelates resolved to remedy this inconveniency, as they effectually did, but the king, receiving intelligence of the matter, caused Victor, the primate of Carthage, to be apprehended. All this time our saint lay concealed, though sought after eagerly by many citizens for their bishop. Thinking the danger over, he appeared again. But Ruspa, now a little town called Alfak, in the district of Tunis, still remained without a pastor, and by a consent of the primate, while detained in the custody of the king's messengers, Fulgentius was forcibly taken out of his cell and consecrated bishop in 508. His new dignity made no alteration in his manners. He never wore the erarium, a kind of stole then used by bishops, nor other clothes than his usual coarse garb, which was the same in winter and summer. 
He went sometimes barefoot. He never undressed to take rest and always rose to prayer before the midnight office. His diet chiefly consisted of pulse and herbs, with which he contented himself without consulting the palate's gratification by borrowed tastes. But in more advanced years, finding his sight impaired by such a regimen, he admitted the use of a little oil. It was only in very considerable bodily indispositions that he suffered a drop on two of wine to be mingled with the water which he drank, and he never could be prevailed upon in any seeming necessity to use the least quantity of flesh meat from the time of his monastic profession till his death. His modesty, meekness, and humility gained him the affection of all, even of the ambitious deacon Felix, who had opposed his election, and whom the saint received and treated with the most cordial charity. His great love for a recluse life induced him to build a monastery near his own house at Ruspa, which he designed to put under the direction of his ancient friend Felix. But before the building could be completed, or he acquit himself to his wish of his episcopal duties, orders were issued from King Thrasimund for his banishment to Sardinia, with others to the number of sixty Orthodox bishops. Fulgentius, though the youngest of this venerable body who were transported from Carthage to Sardinia, was notwithstanding their sole oracle in all doubts and their tongue and pen upon all occasions, and not only of them, but even of the whole Church of Africa. What spread a brighter luster on these amiable qualities were the humility and modesty with which he always declared his sentiments. He never preferred his counsel to that of another. His opinion he never intruded. Pope Symmachus, out of his pastoral care and charity, sent every year provisions in money and clothes to these champions of Christ. A letter of this pope to them is still extant, in which he encourages and comforts them. And it was at the same time that he sent them certain relics of Saints Nazarius and Romanus, that the example and patronage, as he expresses it, of those generous soldiers of Christ might animate the confessors to fight valiantly the battles of the Lord. St. Fulgentius, with some companions, converted his house at Cagliari into a monastery, which immediately became the comfort of all in affliction, the refuge of the poor, and the oracle to which the whole country resorted for deciding their controversies without appeal. In this retirement, the saint composed many learned treatises for confirming and instructing the faithful in Africa. King Thrasimund, hearing that he was their principal support and their invincible advocate, was desirous of seeing him and having accordingly sent for him, appointed him lodgings in Carthage. The king then drew up a set of objections, to which he required his immediate answer. The saint, without hesitation, complied with, and discharged the injunction, and this is supposed to be his book entitled An Answer to Ten Objections. The king equally admired his humility and learning, and the Orthodox triumphed exceedingly in the advantage their cause gained by this piece. To prevent a second time the same effect, the king, when he sent him new objections, ordered them to be only read to him. Fulgentius refused to give an answer in writing unless he was allowed to take a copy of them. He addressed, however, to the king an ample and modest confutation of Arianism, which we have under the title of his three books to King Thrasimund. The prince was pleased with the work and granted him permission to reside at Carthage, till upon repeated complaints from the Arian bishops of the success of his preaching, which threatened, they said, a total extinction of their sect in Carthage, he was sent back to Sardinia in 520. Being ready to go aboard the ship, he said to a Catholic whom he saw weeping, Grieve not, Juliatus, for that was his name. I shall shortly return, and we shall see the true faith of Christ flourish again in this kingdom, with full liberty to profess it, but divulge not this secret to any. The event confirmed the truth of the prediction. His humility concealed the multiplicity of miracles which he wrought, and he was wont to say, A person may be endowed with the gift of miracles, and yet may lose his soul. Miracles ensure not salvation. They may indeed procure esteem and applause, but what will it avail a man to be esteemed on earth, and afterwards be delivered up to hell, torments? If the sick, for whom he prayed, recovered, to avoid being puffed up with vain glory, he ascribed it wholly to the divine mercy. Being returned to Cagliari, he erected a new monastery near that city, and was exceedingly careful to supply his monks with all necessaries, especially in sickness, but would not suffer them to ask for anything, alleging, that we ought to receive all things as from the hand of God, with resignation and gratitude. Thus, he was sensible how conducive the unreserved denial of the will is for perfecting ourselves in the paths of virtue. 
King Thrasimund died in 523, having nominated Hilderic his successor. Knowing him inclined to favor the Orthodox, he exacted from him an oath that he would never restore their profession. To evade this, Hilderic, before the death of his predecessor, signed an order for the liberty of the Orthodox churches, but never had the courage to declare himself of the same belief, his lenity having quite degenerated into softness and indolence. However, the professors of the true faith called home their pastors. The ship which brought them back was received at Carthage with the greatest demonstrations of joy. The shore echoed far and near with repeated acclamations, more particularly when Fulgentius appeared on the upper deck of the vessel. The confessors went straight to the church of St. Agilius to return thanks to God and were accompanied by thousands. But on their way, being surprised with a sudden storm, the people, to show their singular regard for Fulgentius, made a kind of umbrella over his head with their cloaks to defend him from the inclemency of the storm. The saint hastened to his own church and immediately set about the reformation of the abuses that had crept in during the persecution, which had now continued seventy years. But this reformation was carried on with a sweetness that won, sooner or later, the hearts of the most vicious. In a council held at Junque in 524, a certain bishop named Quadvulteus disputed the precedency with our saint, who made no reply, though he would not oppose the council, which ordered him to take the first place. The other resented this as an injury offered to the dignity of his see, and St. Fulgentius, in another council soon after, publicly requested that Quadvultius might be allowed the precedency. His talents for preaching were singular, and Boniface, the Archbishop of Carthage, never heard him without watering all the time the ground with his tears, thanking God for having given so great a pastor to his church. About a year before his death, he secretly retired from all business into a monastery on the little island, or rock, called Circinia, in order to prepare himself for his passage to eternity, which he did with extraordinary fervor. The necessities and importunities of his flock recalled him to Ruspa a little before his exit. He bore the violent pains of his last illness for seventy days with admirable patience, having this prayer almost always in his mouth, Lord, grant me patience now, and hereafter mercy and pardon. The physicians advised him the use of baths, to whom he answered, can baths make a mortal man escape death when his life is arrived at its final period? He would abate nothing of his usual austerities without an absolute necessity. In his agony, calling for his clergy and monks, who were all in tears, he begged pardon if he had ever offended any one of them. He comforted them, gave them some short, moving instructions, and calmly breathed forth his pious soul in the year 533, and of his age the 65th on the 1st of January, on which day his name occurs in many calendars soon after his death and in the Roman, but in some few on the 16th of May, perhaps the day on which his relics were translated to Bourges in France about the year 714, where they still remain deposited. His disciple relates that Pontien, a neighboring bishop, was assured in a vision of his glorious immortality. The veneration for his virtues was such that he was interred within the church, contrary to the law and custom of that age, as is remarked by the author of his life. St. Fulgiodius proposed to himself St. Augustine for a model, and, as a true disciple, imitated him in his conduct, faithfully expounding his doctrine and imbibing his spirit. 